Rhino is a tool for making three-dimensional models and generating images and drawings from them. Um, this is a very first introduction to Rhino, so we're going to start with the very basics. Uh, I'll familiarise you with the interface, I'll show you how to make simple models, move things around, uh, and then we're going to generate a set of measured drawings from our model uh, and make our first renders. I'm going to be using Rhino version 7 for the PC. Uh, you might be using a Mac version or a different version of Rhino. Um, it should all still work just fine, uh, but along the way I'll highlight some small differences uh, between the interface on the PC and the Mac. Uh, if you're a student, you can get a great student discount for buying a copy of Rhino, um, and in the notes for this video I'll leave a link to where you can do that. When you start Rhino, it asks you what template you want to use. We're going to use the Large Objects Millimeters template. If you're on a Mac, the startup screen looks like this. Uh, you can see your recent files here, or your templates here. This is where you're going to select Large Objects Millimeters, and then you choose New Model. So this is the Rhino interface. We have views of our model in the middle. We have a series of tools for modeling on the left-hand side. We have some more general tools at the top. If they look different at the top here, make sure that you click on the standard tab so that you're seeing the standard set of tools. We also have a command line, which is where we're going to be able to enter commands uh, by name using the keyboard. We have our snaps buttons at the bottom, which we'll be using later on. And we have some panels on the right hand side. These panels can change, so if you click on this little uh, sprocket here, you can uh, select the particular panels that you want to show. The one that's most important for this session is to see the layers palette. If you've got any other toolbars showing, like I have here, um, floating, you can just close those safely. On the Mac the interface looks slightly different. You still have your model views in the middle, your modeling tools on the left hand side. Your snaps are at the bottom of the toolbar by default instead of along the bottom of the screen. You have your tabs full of uh, tools at the top for general tools. And on the right hand side you have your panels. On the Mac they are divided into two sets of panels. You have the properties panel at the top and all the rest of your panels here. Again you have the little sprocket you can click on to choose which ones you want to see and you'll need to make sure that you can see the layers palette for this one. You can also use the bar between these to slide to see more of one or the other. Your command bar, instead of appearing at the top of the screen, uh, appears at the very top of your um, modelling tools. By default we're looking at four views of our model. This grid that we can see here is called the construction plane. This doesn't render or show up any of, any of our drawings, it's just a construction aid, kind of a floor that we're going to be modelling on. We can zoom in and out using the scroll wheel on the mouse. I can use the right mouse button by clicking and dragging to rotate my view. And if I hold down shift while I right click and drag, I can pan my view sliding it to the side. And those are your three main viewing operations. So let's give ourselves something to look at. Over here in the modeling tools, I'm going to select the box tool. When I click it, the command bar tells me that it's waiting for me to select the first corner of the base. And I can do that by clicking anywhere in any one of my four viewport windows. And that becomes the starting point for my box. It's then asking me for the opposite corner, so I can click again, and then it asks me for the height. And if I just move my cursor up, you'll see it's constrained to moving vertically here, and I can click again to see the full three-dimensional object. I can rotate around, I can zoom in and out, and I can pan to see that object. As well as clicking on the button box, I can also type the word box into the command bar at the top here which is exactly the same as if I'd clicked the button. Once again I can click to create the base shape of my box and then raise it up to create the three-dimensional form. Once I've got some objects in my scene I can make a few, uh, I have a few other ways to control my view. I can select an existing object by clicking on the edge of it and it goes yellow like this to show that I've selected it. If I want to see all of the objects in my scene at once uh, I click on this tool here, the magnifying glass zoom extents which will make sure that everything in uh, my scene is visible in that view. If I right click on that tool it'll do the same in all my viewports at once. So now I can see all of the geometry in my scene in each window, each viewport. If I've got something selected I can use the tool next to it which is zoom selected 
which means that now it's going to zoom just to the object that I've got selected. And if I right click, it will do the same in all viewports. It also re-centers the view. So if you've got a number of objects in your scene and you want to be able to center in on a particular, uh, at a particular point, you can select an object and use that to center your view. And now you're pivoting around that. So if I select this object here, click zoom selected, that's now the center of my view. At the moment I'm looking at a wireframe of my objects, which means that it's just showing the edges. If I want to see these as solid objects, I can right click on the uh, viewport title here and select shaded. And now I can see my objects as solid objects. Another view um, mode that you might like is ghosted, which is kind of a hybrid. It shows you the solid object, but you can also see kind of what's happening behind it. These menus here um, also have another trick. If I right click, I can select maximize and that window uh, now becomes full screen. I can do the same thing by right clicking and selecting restore or I can double click on that title. If I've got an object that I don't need anymore, I can select it and use the delete key on my keyboard to get rid of it. Once I've created some objects, I'm going to want to move them around. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to slide down to the bottom of the screen here and find the uh, button for gumball, make sure that that's turned on. If you're on a Mac, the gumball button is right at the very top here. Once you've selected that, you can grab these handles to manip manipulate this object. So if I grab this handle here, I can slide my object in this axis, or this axis, or vertically. There are three little squares which allow me to scale the object, so I can scale it, stretch it in that direction. And I can also rotate it using these um, three curved lines as well, which allow me to turn the object. If I hold shift down while I'm doing that, it will snap to 90 degrees. If I want a little more control over how I'm moving these objects, I can use the transform tools in the toolbar here. This is my move tool. If I select it, I can see the command bars asking me to choose an object. So if I select one of these objects and press enter, it then asks me for a point to move from and a point to move to. These don't have to be points on your object, so I could click over here and then move my object that way. Below the move tool I have the rotate tool, so if I select an object to rotate, press enter, I can then choose the center of rotation, so I'm going to start here and then I can give two points to create a reference angle for my rotation. If I hold shift, it allows me to move those to 90 degrees. And I can also scale objects. So if I select this object here, I can use the scale tool. Um, it asks me for a base point for my scale. It's the point around that I'm going to scale around. Then I give two points to give a reference for the scaling. So I can use the move, rotate and scale tools. I also have a copy tool, which allows me to make duplicates of objects. It works exactly the same as the move tool except that it leaves a copy, a copy behind it every time I click. When I've made enough copies, I can press enter to finish. When we're modeling, we often want to be able to position objects exactly in relationship to one another. So the way that I'm going to do that is using the snaps. On the PC, the snaps are in a row along the bottom here. Uh, on a Mac, they are just below the modeling tools by default. I'm going to tick the end snap. And then when I use the move tool to move this object here, if I point to one of the corners, you'll see my cursor snaps exactly onto the corner and it says end. When I click now, I've chosen that object exactly by that point and I can move it on top of another one to line it up exactly onto an end point of that object. So now I've positioned those objects not roughly close together, but exactly aligned. I can do the same thing with this block here. I use the move tool make sure my end point is selected and I can position those objects exactly in relationship to one another. Another one that you might find handy is the midpoint object snap. So if I turn that one on as well, now I can snap objects to the midpoint of an edge. So now if I move this object, you can see that I can snap not just to the end of the object but also to its midpoint. So if I snap the midpoint of that object and line it up to one of the others, I can position it uh, along the center. 
you can have any combination of snaps turned on at once. If you have them all on it gets a little bit confusing so usually uh, you want to turn off the ones that you're not using. Pause here and have a play. Make sure that you can model a box and that you can manipulate it using the transform tools and the gumball and that you can control your view. Underneath uh, all of these tools on the menu bar here where there's a small triangle uh, there are more tools. If you're looking for the next challenge, have a play with the cylinder tool and see how see if you can work out how that functions. So let's make our first model. Um, you can make a lot just using the box tool and in this one here we're going to make a small side table. Let's start by saving our file. Give your file a name. You'll see that the file type is .3dm. You can take this file between Mac or PC and it will work fine. Just be aware that if you've made your model in a later version of Rhino, in this case Rhino 7, it's sometimes harder to open it in an earlier version. I'm saving mine into my uh, online service so that I can make sure that my files are all backed up as I go. So let's start with the tabletop. I'm going to use the box tool. Instead of clicking to put the, to uh, the first point, I can also type in exact locations. So here, the first corner of the base, instead of clicking to position that, I'm going to type in 0, 0, 0 that's X, Y, Z coordinates, to make sure that my tabletop starts exactly on the zero point of um, the construction plane. Now I want to specify the exact dimensions of the tabletop. Uh, it's asking me for the, the length of the table, so I'm going to say it's 1200 millimeters long. Now it's asking me for the width, which is going to be 600. And now it's asking me for the height, which is going to be 30 millimeters. And here's my tabletop. Next I'm going to construct the uh, substructure, so there's a rectangle of rails underneath it which, is going to use, which I'm going to use to attach the legs. So let's make one of those rails first. So here's a box, it's going to be 900 long this time, 45 wide and 45 deep. So I've got a rail, I want to position it exactly underneath that table. So I'm going to use my snaps, make sure that I've got my end snap on, use the move tool. First of all I'm going to select the object and position this corner here. Now in the right hand side view I'm going to move that in 100 millimeters, And I'm going to hold shift to make sure that uh, it's exactly flat before I click. On the front view here I'm going to do the same, this time moving it along 150 millimeters so that it's centered. I hold shift before I click to make sure that I'm keeping it um, level. So there's one rail. I could make and position the other exactly the same way but I can also take a bit of a shortcut here. Um, underneath the move tool there are some more transform tools including this one, mirror. And it asks me to select the objects to mirror, which is this bar. And then I'm going to use my midpoint snap to snap halfway along the table and draw a line right across the middle. And that acts as a mirror line reflecting the object to the other side. Now I want to create a, a, a rail that runs across the other way. So I'm going to use the box tool again. I'm going to choose my starting point. Might be easier if I do this in the side view here. I can choose my ending point. Uh, and now I'm going to type in 45 to make sure it's the right thickness. There it is. You might, once you've entered it in, you might need to adjust the position to line it up, and you can do that using your snaps. Again, I'm going to select this object, choose the mirror tool, and draw the mirror plane through the middle here. And now I have my substructure. Let's give our table some legs. If I use the box tool, I can click and create a box that is 45 by 45. And if I think if I make it uh, 675 high, that should give me a tabletop height of 750. So once I've got my leg, I want to put it under the table. I could move it down under the table, but I might actually lift the table up onto the leg. So I can select all of this by drawing a box around it to grab it all at once. 
then I can use my move tool to position and my end snap to position this point here at that point there and now I can see I've got my table sitting up on one of its legs. I think this table is going to look a bit chunkier maybe I need to refine this leg a bit. If I select an object uh, all at once it all goes yellow. I can also just select part of it though if I hold control and shift or if you're on a Mac command and shift and then click on just one edge of it you can see I can select just a part of that uh, table leg in this case just one edge. Uh, this means I can now grab my manipulator and drag it out or in to taper that leg. If I wanted to be exact about that I'm just going to undo that with Control Z Control Shift select the edge. Instead of dragging this uh, manipulate tool I can click on it and it gives me a little box asking me how far I want to maneuver it and in this time, case I'm going to make it minus 15. Yeah that looks nice. So then on the other side of my table leg once again Control Shift to select just that one edge. You'll see here it doesn't know which edge I'm trying to which edge or face I want to select, so it pops up a little menu asking me to clarify. That's the one I want. Now I'm going to click on this arrow here. Once again, go minus 15, and now my table legs got a nice little taper on it. Now I'm happy with my leg. I can copy that into place using the mirror tool. I select the object. I mirror it, use my mid snap to position that, and now I can select both of these, select one and hold shift to select another object, and now I can mirror that onto the other side. Now over to you, see if you can model a rail around the lower part of the legs um, to create a shelf and use the box tool to create some slats or a top for that shelf. And here's the table I've made, so you can see I've got um, used the box tool to create rails around between the legs, I've created flat boxes to use as the slats across the top, I've then used the cylinder tool to create this little metal bar that's going to run between the legs, and I've used the same process I did for tapering the legs to put a little bevel on the edge of the table top. So once you're happy with your table, make sure that you have saved your work and we can move on to making a set of measured drawings from it. Now we're ready to make some measured drawings of our table. These need to be accurate and to scale, like the sort of thing that we'd use to make the table ourselves or that we might be taking to fabricators to do the work for us. These need to be orthographic drawings that we can measure off, not perspective views. The tool we're going to use to do this is the make 2D command. So we're going to select our object by drawing a line, a box right around it. And then we're going to find the make 2D command which lives underneath this tool here, like that. You can also have the same, same effect by typing make 2D into the command bar at the top. So whether you click the tool or type make 2D, you'll get the same result. It pops up a little um, dialog box that asks you how, how you want to prepare these drawings. So you can choose either one single view and just make a 2D image of that view or uh, we can choose to create a set of views. So third angle projection or first angle projection are just different ways of producing um, four views at once of your object, three orthographic views and a perspective. I'm going to make sure that I've got hidden lines and tangent lines off and I've got group output on. This means that I won't get hundreds of little separate lines, but that I'll get a group of lines that I can handle together. When I select OK, you can see that Rhino has generated a set of two-dimensional drawings of my table. It's used the construction plane to draw them on, and if I go to my top view, it's the easiest view for seeing them. It's created a separate layer in my layers palette here, so at the moment my table is modelled on the default layer, I have a bunch of other layers that don't have things on them, and now I've got a new layer called Make 2D with some sub layers underneath it. If you click this little triangle here, you can make those expand or contract those sections. Uh, if I double click on the Make 2D layer, 
you can see that now that's ticked that's the that's the layer that I'm drawing working onto um, I can now use this light bulb to hide my default layer so my table's still there it's just hidden on this other layer I can turn it back on at any time so now I can see my uh, drawings of my table I can have a top view two side views uh, and a little perspective I also can verify that the dimensions are correct if I use the measure tool which hides here under the analyze tools I can measure the distance from this point to this point and confirm that it's 1200 millimeters so this table is uh, at the moment is drawn at full size now I've got a couple of options um, I may want to prepare these drawings in another program so for example I might want to take these uh, this drawing across to Illustrator where I can finish it off or into another CAD program if I want to do that I can select all of the geometry or the lines that I want to uh, export I can go to file export selected and instead of exporting it as a Rhino file a 3DM I can export it as an Adobe Illustrator file an AI if you go into another CAD program you find might find it's better to use the DXF format uh, if I export the file as an AI it's not going to take any 3D geometry across it's just going to take um, 2D lines and I'm going to give this a name as it's exporting it wants to know how to handle the scale of the object if I leave it ticked at snapshot of the current view then it will just generate an unscaled image that's just whatever will fit on a piece of paper but that's not what I want I need this to, these to be accurate scaled drawings so I'm going to preserve the model scale and I want the drawing to be a tenth of the real world size I want to work in millimeters here um, this little dialog box here is a little bit confusing it's kind of reversed from from the usual way we would count things usually we would say we want to make a 1 to 10 set of drawings that means one tenth of real life so here it means I need to put in 10 millimeters in real life becomes one millimeter in the drawing and I select OK it tells me that the file was successfully saved and when I open the file up in Illustrator if I check the dimensions of my tabletop I can confirm that this is 120 millimeters across which means that I've got it correctly at uh, a scale of 1 to 10 now this isn't a, an illustrator tutorial but from this point I could uh, lay it out on the size page I want add annotations or color or adjust line weights to get the drawing the way that I wanted it alternatively I can also prepare the drawing set directly in Rhino and to do that we're going to change from our standard modeling tools to our drafting tools uh, so there's a tab along the top here called drafting which changes our tools along here and gives us line drawing tools in the modeling tools uh, toolbar I'm going to select new layout and it asks me what size page what size page do I want to work on and in this case I think I'm going to choose an A3 page in landscape and I'm going to leave this initial detail count at 1 and I'll explain what that is in just a moment when I click OK you can see I'm now looking at my A3 piece of paper um, and my views changed I'm no longer looking at the model space I'm looking at this uh, single piece of paper if I want to get back to my model I can do that by just double clicking on the uh, viewport title here it brings me back to my three-dimensional view I can find my layouts over here in my panels make sure that your layouts uh, panel is showing then you can jump to your layouts and you can see here is my page and if I double click on that I can get back to my layout on my page I can see that I've got a rectangular frame that contains my drawing this frame is uh, what it meant by having a detail so you can have many frames or details laid out on a single page and each of those could be a separate view of your model if you double click inside your detail frame you're now looking directly at your model you can see the construction plane there and we can uh, use our drawing tools or our modeling tools to add to our model directly in the viewport there if I jump back to my 3d model you can see that that line I drew appears here in my 3d model space if I double click back out of my um, 
detail view. Now I'm looking at my page and the color of the page has changed to show me that if I draw a line here now, this is on my page, not in the model. And if I go back to my model, you can see that line doesn't exist in the model space. It's only on my page. When I select this uh, detail frame, if I go to my properties panel, which I can see here, or you can find in here, it tells me the scale that that view is currently working at. So 1, one to 7.734 is not useful. I want this to be 1 to 10. And I can also lock that view to make sure that I don't accidentally change it or rescale it. Even if I click into the view now, I can't pan and resize that, um, that view because it's keeping it locked to the scale that I wanted it at. At this point, I might want to add details or labels. I can add a label here using the text tool. If I click on create text, it brings up a little window that uh, I can use to format that text. When I click OK, it asks me to position it. Once I'm happy that I've got my drawing laid out the way I want it, the scale is correct. I've done any annotation or adjustments, added any lines to my drawing, cleaned it up the way that I like it. I can uh, go to File Print, which will allow me to save this as a PDF. And here's my PDF file uh, ready to print or to send to someone. Alongside these measured drawings, I'd like to have um, some nice 3D images of nice perspectives of my model. So I've got a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, first of all, I'm going to jump back to my default layout. I can turn that on, make it visible by clicking on the light bulb. I can double click on it to uh, make sure that that's now the layer that I'm using. And I'm going to use the light bulb to hide my Make 2D layer so that I don't see the drawings anymore. If I just want a quick uh, 3D image, I can go to View, Capture to File, and in this dialog, make sure that I'm choosing the viewport that I want, uh, and then whether I want the resolution to just be however many pixels this image here is, or something higher. So if I'm going to print this, for example, I might want to go higher. I can click OK and give my image a name. That saves me an image which looks like this, which is just what I was seeing in my viewport before, um, higher resolution without the grid. If I want a higher quality image, I'm going to be rendering it. Rendering is simulating the way that light will fall onto the object and the way that its materials or surfaces will look to create a pixel-based image of the object. To set up rendering, I'm going to uh, click on my little sprocket here and choose rendering to make sure that I can see my rendering tools. By default the object is all white when we come to render it so let's assign some materials. If I select the object and go to the properties tab um, I'll find this material um, button and it shows me that at the moment this tabletop is just using the default material for that layer. If I drop this down though I can tell it I want to use something different. And what I'm going to use is a physically based material. This is the type of material that you'll use for, um, for most surfaces. There's a lot of settings that we can fiddle with in materials and it's um, lots of possibilities. The simplest one that we can use though is the color of the object. And if I click here, I can choose what color I want this tabletop to be. You'll notice that I can't see it in shaded view. I can get a preview of it if I switch to rendered view. And if I jump to ray traced view, I can get a more sophisticated image again. Here I've selected these slats, which I want to be the same color as the tabletop. So you see when I've selected those and gone to the material properties, um, I could create the material again, but it actually shows me that I've got that material sitting here. If I click on that, it will set those to be the same. So here you can see that I've assigned some simple materials to my object. Once I'm happy with my materials, I can switch to a ray traced view, just to confirm that everything's the way that I want it. Once I've got it looking right here, I'm ready to create my render. Under my render settings, I'm going to check my dimensions here, and in fact I'm going to change them so that they're something larger. 
if you're planning on printing your image, you should be working to a, uh, a minimum image size of uh, about 2000 pixels. When I've got the setting the way that I want it, I can hit the render button at the bottom here. And you can see here that it's counting up as it renders this image until it's done. Um, once the image is done, I can use the save button up here to save my image. Um, this is only a small preview though, and if you zoom in you'll see it's quite pixelated. Um, so I'm going to go back and increase the size of my image. And instead of draft quality, I'm going to slide this up to good quality. When I hit render you'll see that now it's counting up further, which means it's taking longer to make the image, um, but I'm going to get a better result. And there you have it, your first model in Rhino. Um, there's obviously a lot more that you can do, uh, but you'd be surprised how far you can get just with these basics. Um, from here, the best way to learn is to model something of your own. For example, you might uh, take a piece of furniture that you have at home and measure that up and see if you can make an accurate model uh, using Rhino. Happy modeling.